right, let's talk about the respiratory system a little bit. The respiratory system you'll also hear is referred to as the pulmonary system. So we, we talked just a little bit about blood vessels a while back and I kept referring to the pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins is going to the lungs. So the respiratory system is basically the whole passageway to exchange oxygen and CO2 in your body. So it's not just the lungs, it's also the nose, it's the pharynx, it's the larynx, and the parts that we're going to talk about, like the bronchi. So your body's constantly burning oxygen and fuel, like glucose and lipids and amino acids, just like your car burns gasoline for fuel. It takes oxygen and gasoline and it puts out CO2. Don't mistake CO2 for CO. CO is carbon monoxide, CO2 is carbon dioxide. Your body is constantly making carbon dioxide. It doesn't make carbon monoxide. When carbon monoxide gets in your body, it can stick to your red blood cells and prevent oxygen from binding. So the way that CO2 and CO work is very, very different. All right? Respiratory system, like I already said, is there for exchange of gases, helping you release CO2 and helping you bring oxygen in. And then it works with the cardiovascular system to help transport gases throughout your body. So it helps move it from the lungs to everywhere else in the body that, that the... Um, gases need to go to. If you stop either system, you're in for big trouble. So you can actually push the lungs, you can compress the lungs, and you can ventilate the body, which is not the same as respiration. Ventilation is just the movement of air in and out of your lungs. So you can have no heartbeat, you can have no blood moving, and you can still ventilate a dead person. You can put air in their lungs and make it sound like they're breathing. But if the cardiovascular system's not working, they're not getting any you know, passageway of oxygen and CO2 through their body. So you have to have both systems working. At the same time, if you plug up somebody's nose and mouth and they can't get fresh oxygen in, they're going to suffocate to death even if their heart is beating. So you have to have both going. Right? And then um, when we talked a little bit about heart attacks in the cardiovascular section, I talked about how quickly uh, cells die from oxygen. So within 30 seconds of depriving oxygen, heart muscle will start struggling and and then creating reactive oxygen species and causes damage. So you have to have oxygen constantly. The same thing with the brain. If you plug up the blood vessels going up to the brain within 15 seconds, you'll black out. And then if you keep depriving them of oxygen, then they'll actually die. The nervous system will die. So we're going to talk about the anatomy of the respiratory system since this is anatomy. And we'll start with the nose. And then we'll work our way down. We'll go nose and behind the nose is the pharynx. A lot of people refer to it as the throat. And then the larynx is the voice box that's right at the top of the windpipe and the windpipe is the trachea. As you go a little bit deeper, the trachea will start splitting or branching off, and those branches are called the bronchi. And then when you get down into the actual lung tissue, we're going to talk a lot in detail about what makes up the lung tissue, like the connective tissue and the little structures called alveoli, the millions and millions of little tiny air pockets inside your chest that exchange oxygen and CO2 with the blood. Right? And then we'll talk about some of the locations of infections. And when we do that, we'll refer to the upper respiratory tract, and that's basically above the vocal cords. And when you talk about the vocal cords, the voice box, you want to think the larynx. So above the larynx. And then the lower respiratory tract is everything below the vocal cords. So when they say you have an upper respiratory infection, they're talking about something that's up in like the, the nose, the nasal sinuses. They're talking about uh, back in the pharynx, in the back of the throat. And when they're talking about below, they're talking about basically the windpipe and uh, the bronchi, so something like bronchitis or asthma in the lower uh, respiratory tract infections. So here you can see the actual human anatomy. Oops, where'd my little mouse go? There we go. And this is showing you at the beginning is the, the, the trachea. Up here at the top is actually the larynx, the voice box, and then the trachea is the tube that you can feel. If you squeeze the front of your throat, you can feel those strong cartilaginous rings that are your trachea. And as they come down, they branch off into the left and the right. Uh, lungs. And don't forget, when you describe the left and the right lungs, you're describing the patient's perspective. So this would be the left side. And when we talked about the heart, you can see the heart sits more over to the left side. This is where the more powerful muscular part of the heart is on the left side. And then over on the right side is just the, well, the opposite, the patient's right. And we'll talk about this. When you look at the cavity where um, the lungs sit, the lungs sit in a thoracic cavity. Where you talk about the heart, the heart sits right in the mediastinum, right in the middle. So don't forget your cavities and your definition, your anatomical terms as we're going through this too. Um, so let's talk about the nose. 
And the nose, we've talked about some of these structures before when we talked about the skull. So here you have the nasal bones, remember, they form the top bridge part, the hard part that you can kind of knock on up there. That's the firm structure. And then the maxilla, remember, it comes down here, <clears throat> excuse me, and forms the upper part of the teeth. And then what do you call that cheekbone over here? Well, that's the zygomat. So here you see the bones that form the ridge around here, the outer edge of the, the nose. You can wiggle the front of your nose because the nose is made of a lot of cartilage. And that cartilage is that clear glassy cartilage. Do you remember the H word that's the name for the glassy cartilage? It's hyaline. Right? So when you're looking at these structures, the nose is very wiggly. The nose has um, a lot of flexibility, except for up here at the top, it's a bridge where it's actually made out of bone. On the inside, you have mucous membrane. And the mucous membrane is actually highly vascularized. There are lots and lots of blood vessels in there. And those blood vessels actually work like radiators. So what they do is they put hot blood up and through the nose and actually warm the air as it comes in because the air is extremely dry and extremely cold. You know, like in the wintertime, as you breathe it in, those warm mucous membranes in there will actually moisten the air and help warm it up so that as that air goes into your nose and back down your throat, it doesn't get down into your lungs and dry out your lungs. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we, we go along too. The openings out here are called the nasal nares. And we commonly refer to them as your nostrils. All right. So the internal structures, when you start going inside the nose, so here are the nasal nares, here you're coming up, don't forget, here's your cartilage, here's your nasal bones. As you bring air in up, this first area in here is called the nasal conch. And so it's a large chamber up in here. And the nasal conch actually has a divider or septum that goes down in the middle. When you look at the top part, the top part's the ethmoid bone. And a significant structure in here is called the cribriform plate. And the cribriform plate sits right up here and actually holds um, the olfactory nerve, which is your nerve for smell that holds all this, the sensory structures in here. The cribriform plate's significant because if you have trauma up here and it, it cracks, you can see how close the brain is to the top of the nose. So if you inhale things in or you inhale particles or bacteria or virus particles, if that's cracked, they can actually get into your brain. And a common infection is actually a herpes simplex virus that can penetrate through or move up through this plate. So it's really dangerous for staph infections or strep infections that can get up in there. So the ethmoid bone is this bone up here, and then the cribriform plate is right there inside of it. Right? Oh, I skipped over this. So the bottom here, the hard palate. Remember when we were talking about the the um, the palatine bone, forming the bottom or the base of the the uh, base of the nose, the top of the the mouth and the base of the nose. And then the nasal nares inside. As you're going through here, you have these structures called the nasal conchae. And the conchae are there, and they're kind of rigid. And I'll talk about them a little bit more. But they're really rigid, so they allow air to pass over them, and they have a high surface area, so of course it helps warm the air a little bit better. Right? The nasal septum itself is, is cartilage and it's bone. When we were looking at the ethmoid bone and the sphenoid bones and everything up in there, we were looking at the shapes and how they start forming together and then the ethmoid comes down here and, and actually helps form the conch. When you look at an actual anatomical cut, so if you're doing a mid-sagittal cut right down in the middle, dividing the person left to right, you can see all the structures in here. And you actually see all these sinus cavities. So remember, these are air pockets that are lined with mucus lining. So they can change when the air pressure changes, and that what's, that's what gives you that uncomfortable like sinus pressure. Like when you eat something cold and it's pushed up here at the roof of the mouth, and it starts cooling these chambers up here, it actually changes the, the sinuses. So the nasal structures, I started talking about this already, olfactory is referring to the sensory organ for smell. So the olfactory epithelium is where you actually have all the little tiny receptors for smell. So you've got these 10,000 little receptors or 10,000 different smells that you can smell that take up a little tiny patch at the top of the nose. It's about the size of a stamp, a postage stamp. So it's not very big, but it's extremely sensitive to things. So as you inhale or breathe in different particles, they stick to the mucus they trigger this, these receptors on the olfactory nerve and they allow you to smell different sensations. Right? The types of cells in here, the pseudostratified ciliated columnar cells. Pseudostratified, remember, means it's false stratified, which is only one layer, but it looks like more than one. And it's ciliated. They have little tiny cilia, and the cilia increase the surface area. 
So they had these ridges that go up and down. And the cilia also help move things. So if you inhale uh, particles or dust or debris or some bacteria, the cilia will actually help move it forward so you can you know, pick it later. And then the goblet cells make a mucus secretion that kind of helps you to move things, keeps it moistened, and as that mucus goes across the cilia, it helps repel things. So it moves it forward to try and get it out of your lungs or away from your lungs and closer to the outside part of your body. And then because of all that increased surface area, the cilia it helps warm the air a lot faster. And I already mentioned this, it's highly vascularized and it acts like a radiator. So all that warm, hot blood and that moist mucus basically moisten the air and, and uh, warm it as it comes in. And then I already mentioned this. So the cilia actually helps move the mucus up and, and towards the pharynx so that you can help clear it away so it doesn't go down into your lungs. All right, and the next are the paranasal sinuses, and they open up into the nasal cavity. And then we talked about these bones before with the skull. The sinuses up here are made up of the ethmoid, the sphenoid, the frontal, and the maxillary bones. Those are the four bones that have the sinuses in them. All right, and then we talked about this before, too. The sinuses actually help lighten the skull. So the front of the skull is very light, helps resonate your voice, and it takes a lot of the weight. The back part of the skull, the cranium that wraps around the actual brain itself, is more dense. It's like a concrete cardboard basically the way it's designed but up front you have all these pockets so that the front of your face is a little bit lighter right. next structure is you're moving down so we're moving backwards and we're going into an area called the pharynx I'm gonna skip ahead and show you the picture real quick and then come back so here you have the pharynx here's the nasal conch that large cavity as you're going back and you're breathing air in this whole area is the pharynx and there are three divisions of it you have the upper part which is the nasopharynx you have the middle part that's behind the mouth, and it's called the oropharynx. And down here, as you transition into the voice box, which remember, what was the name of the voice box that started with an L? The larynx. So here they call the laryngeopharynx. They're all pharynx, but whatever structure they're close to is the beginning name, naso, oro, and laryngeo. So when you look at the pharynx, you get this long muscular tube, about five inches long. Basically, it hangs from the skull or comes down from the skull. And it has a lot of skeletal muscle so that you can actually have voluntary control of what's going on in there. You also have mucous membranes. Right? And then it goes all the way from the internal nares all the way to the cricoid cartilage, which we'll talk about in just a little bit as we get down deeper into the throat. And then its main functions is to pass food and to pass air. So, of course, hopefully the nasopharynx is going to be for air exclusively unless you have one of those neat tricks where you can push uh, milk out of your nose or soda out of your nose, then you can push the food up into the nasopharynx, but basically it's for air. And the oropharynx is for air and for food. So when you swallow the food, it goes into the oropharynx. And the laryngeopharynx ideally is for air going into the larynx and the trachea, and then the food will go back to the esophagus, which we'll get to when we get to the GI tract. And then other functions resonating uh, speech, like when you have a really mucusy um, throat and there's a lot of snot at the back of your nasopharynx, obviously your voice sounds different because of that. And then it has tonsils. And we talked about the tonsils briefly when we talked about the immune system. So the sets of tonsils like the palatine tonsils and um, the lingual tonsils are back there too. To try and catch food, or food, bacteria that's in your food or bacteria in the airway, trap them and then the immune system can catch it. Right? So don't forget that's lymphatic tissue we already talked about those before. And then I've talked about the three regions already. So again, up here you have the naso, here you have the oro, and down here you have the laryngeo. Neat features about the naso is this little spot here, this is the eustachian tube. It actually goes all the way up and into your ear. And what it does is it helps equally equilibrate air pressure in the inner ear. And when you have this plug full of mucus or snot, the air pressure in the inner ear expands and it actually muffles your hearing. So um, if this gets plugged in smaller children, they have problems equilibrating that pressure, and also they can get bacteria trapped and then it cause a lot of problems, but that's the eustachian tube. And they also call it the pharyngeotympanic tube, I forgot to mention that, and it doesn't say that in the picture, but pharyngeotympanic tells you it goes from the pharynx up to the tympanic membrane area in the, the ear. All right, so the nasopharynx up at the top goes from the conch all the way down to the soft palate down in here. Remember, hard palates here with the bone, the palatine bone. Soft palates at the back where the uvula hangs down. And then this, again, passed away for air only. And when you look at it, it has a pseudostratified pseudo ciliated columnar epithelium, which I was talking about before. So you have all these cilia to help clear things up. 
is trying to keep things from going in your lung. And I keep saying that over and over again. Even the design of the airway, when you breathe air in, air is going to flow up and hopefully stick particles up here. But if the particles are light enough and they curve around, hopefully they'll stick back here. And then they'll get caught by the pharyngeal tonsils, the immune system. If they're lighter and they come around and down, then hopefully they get caught back here, maybe at the palatine tonsils, or they get caught at the back of the throat. So it's kind of cool the way the airway is designed. It's a twisting, um, kind of tortuous is the word that I was taught, which means bending and winding. So that it's almost like you have this road that goes off in the middle of nowhere and it keeps forking and forking and forking. Well, if you're a bacteria and you're flying through the airway, you don't have a steering wheel. So as you hit one of these forks, hopefully it'll get caught somewhere. And then you have a chance to clear the bacteria up. And that's the reason that we have um, a nose in the middle of our face instead of having noses on our nipples where it's closer to get into our lungs it's because we want that long bending passageway to do things like warm the air, um, moisten the air, and also to catch debris and bacteria. All right, so the next area is the oropharynx. So that when you swallow food or when you inhale air through your mouth, you're bringing that back in through. All right, and it goes from the soft get palate here all the way down to the epiglottis, which we're going to talk about. And the epiglottis is just this little flap that cup comes down and cups over the glottis, which is the area between the vocal folds. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit too. So as you swallow food, the epiglottis comes down and pushes the food back to the esophagus to the stomach. When you're just breathing air, it stays open so you can breathe air right down into your trachea. And then we've talked about these before, like the palatine tonsils on the side walls, the lingual tonsils down here at the back of the tongue. So palatines are up here to the sides of the uvula and up on the back of the tongue is the lingual. And remember, lingual is referring to the tongue. So when you take something sublingually, it means that you're taking it under the tongue up here. And then when you look at the structure, instead of being the pseudostratified ciliated, here you have stratified squamous. Stratified, remember, tells you how many layers. Many. Squamous is telling you they're flat. So this looks just like skin. Why would you want this area to be flat and thick? Well, think when you're swallowing food, all that food's coming back and scraping. It's like basically rubbing food across your arm. You want all of those extra layers to protect it. All right, and then the last one's the laryngeal pharynx down here as you're going down into the, well, the trachea and the larynx. All right, so it goes from the epiglottis all the way down to the cricoid cartilage, which is down here. All right, and then here's the common passageway for food going backwards into the esophagus or air coming forward into the larynx. And this again is stratified squamous epithelium. When it's just air, you don't need the many layers. You have pseudostratified. But when you're pushing food through here, you have to have the many thick layers to protect that air, that well, whole passageway. All right, and then the cartilage of the larynx. And remember, the larynx, <clears throat> excuse me, is where your vocal folds are going to be. So the thyroid cartilage actually forms the Adam's apple, and I have a picture of this on the next slide. And the epiglottis was that little flap that covers over the airway. And the epiglottis, remember, it covers down when you swallow food. So when you're swallowing food, it folds down. When you're breathing air, it pops back up. And then the opening that it covers is technically called the glottis, and the glottis is in between the vocal folds. Next cartilage is called cricoid cartilage, and this forms the rings. And these rings help attach to the top of the trachea. And then you have arytenoid or cartilage that sit on the top of the cricoid, and these have muscles that attach to them and help them with movement. Right? So they're in there helping control the vocal folds or the vocal cords for pitch. So here's a picture of the larynx. So here you can see the epiglottis, the little flap. It's kind of like a leaf that folds down and covers up the glottis. And then as you swallow or breathe air and it comes down through here, the passage goes down into the trachea and then down into the bronchi, and then down into the lungs. And then there's your Adam's apple, or the thyroid cartilage. And the thyroid cartilage sits right above this gland. It's called the thyroid gland. And then the location of it, if you're looking at C4 and C6, what's the C standing for? Well, think about where this is at. C is referring to the neck, and what's the neck area called? The cervical region. So this area sits right in front of cervical vertebra number four down to cerv cervical vertebra number six. So you've got this long section here between C4 and C6. And then when you're looking at it, it actually has three single and three paired sets of cartilage. And they're kind of, well, I'll show you a picture in just a few slides and how they look. But here are the vocal cords. 
So the vocal cords are kind of cool. And I watched this video with Steven Tyler and they were looking at his vocal cords and the way they fold, but it's really neat the way they vibrate when air passes over them. So you have a couple sets here. You have the false vocal cords, which are actually called ventricular folds, and they're above the true vocal cords. The true vocal cords are the ones that flop around and actually make the, the sound. And the true vocal cords are actually called or uh, connected to the arytenoid cartilage and lots of different muscles to help tighten them up and make them tense. So when they tighten up, when you pull them really tight, you have a higher pitched voice. When you loosen them up and you're not so tight, they flap around a lot and they make a deeper voice. It's just like if you look at a guitar or a piano. When you've got the really tight strings, the real tense ones, they have a higher pitched tone to them. But when you have the bigger, fatter, more floppy strings, it makes a, a lower pitch, more bassy sound. It's the same way that your vocal cords work. Testosterone actually thickens up the vocal cords so they have a more low bass-like tone to them. Right? And I kind of jumped the gun and talked about this already, but the true vocal cords contain both skeletal muscle and elastic ligaments. So the skeletal muscle means you have voluntary control over it. You can move them, you can control the pitch. Right? You actually have 10 intrinsic muscles of the larynx that contract, so you can get lots of different tones to it. That's why some people can make their voice sound a lot different because you have so much control with all these different muscles. Right. And then as you're tightening these, as air goes across them, it's, it's almost like a wind instrument. It vibrates the cords and then to vibrate the pitch, and depending on how much air you're pushing it out, it helps affect your tone. And I already said this, so longer, thicker vocal cords, like in a male, gives you a lower pitch, where tighter um, vocal cords actually gives you a higher pitch, just like the strings on a piano or strings on a guitar. So when you look at it in the movement, here you have the vocal cords where they're open, here you have them where they're closed, and what's also interesting is when you follow, swallow food, this epiglottis folds over the vocal cords, but the vocal cords will snap shut. It's like a double safety membrane. So when food comes down, this first fold shuts, the second fold shuts, so if something does slide by the epiglottis, it doesn't actually go down your lungs. What's interesting is that you're, you have lots and lots of receptors along here, so if a little bit of water even leaks past the epiglottis, it really starts triggering the sensitive reaction and makes you start doing what a lot? Well, coughing a lot. So you open these up real quick and <clears throat> you push them out. And then you can see some of the muscles here that help control the cords. And here's an actual picture. So you see the epiglottis. You can actually see the cords down in here. Next structure is the trachea. The trachea is about five inches long, about an inch wide. Then you can feel the trachea in the front when you squeeze the front of your neck. So those, those rings that form the trachea. And it goes all the way from about T5 oops, and down across the esophagus. And then it starts branching off into the bronchi when it gets down into your, your chest cavity a little bit deeper. When you look at the layers of the trachea, it's kind of like the layers of the GI tract that we're going to talk about. I forgot that I switched it around. I usually talk about the GI tract first. But. So you have the layer, the innermost layer, the mucosa, and that's pseudostratified again. Because are you having food going down the trachea or the windpipe? Well, hopefully not. This is air. So you have that pseudostratified columnar, and you also have the cilia. And the cilia are the little finger-like structures that try and bring things back up. So if particles get caught down in here, the cilia will lift them up so they elevate the particles. They lift them back up so that you can ideally either s swallow them or cough them up. You don't want things getting down into your lungs. And then just below that, underneath the mucosa layer, you have the submucosa. And that has a lot of connective tissue and some mucus, basically mucus glands. Right. And then those rings, you have layers of hyaline cartilage. And there are about 16 to 20 of these rings going from the larynx all the way down to the bronchi. When you look at it, and I'll show you a picture on the next two slides, but one side of it is actually a hard ring. The front side, the anterior side is hard. You can touch it, you can feel it. But the other side is kind of open, and it has a muscle in there called trachealis muscle, and that's smooth muscle. So that muscle can expand and move back and forth so that when you swallow food on the back part of the trachea, it bends in. Right? So you can kind of adjust the size of the pipe even. And I'll show you. So here you have the larynx and then you have the trachea and you see these rings going all the way down, these hard rings. You can feel these rings in the front of your throat. On the back side of that you have a muscle that's connected to it. And I'll show you that too. But here the trachea comes down and then it branches off into the bronchi. So if you look at this, they call it the trachea and the bronchial tree. And if you flip this upside down and held it right here, 
you can see how all these branches come out and it's almost like little branches all over the place like branches on a tree so a bronchial tree and you see it goes trachea to the primary bronchi to the secondary bronchi tertiary bronchi and there are actually 23 divisions all together of bronchi and we'll talk about that just a little bit more when we get to the bronchi section and you get all the way to the end where it goes into the lung itself and when you hear or read in a book where it says the lung in general when it says the lung a lot of times it's just referring to the tissue that forms the lung these tissues called alveoli and these little tiny cells we'll talk about that in better better detail and then here on the bottom you can see the diaphragm that helps move the lung for breathing All right so the actual trachea itself if we sliced across it so now we're going to do a transverse section back here we were actually just looking at the front. Now we're going to slice across like this and look down inside of it. So here's that cartilaginous ring coming out here towards the front of your throat and the anterior portion. And then back here, you actually have that tracheolus muscle. And the tracheolus muscle can be tensed or pulled and tighten these sides, almost like a horseshoe, bringing the horseshoe edges together. Or when it's relaxed, when you swallow food, this is the esophagus or the passageway that goes to your stomach. So as food slides down here, that muscle can stretch a little bit and bend in this way so the food can slide right on by. If this were one firm round ring, it'd be hard to swallow food because the esophagus wouldn't have any room to flex. So up here, remember you have this hard cartilage, but back here, what's sitting right behind the esophagus? Think about it. Imagine your neck. The front's the trachea, right behind that's the esophagus, and what's at the back of your neck? The vertebra. So there's not a lot of room for the esophagus to expand if you didn't have this tracheus muscle that can flex and bend a little bit. Okay. And I already talked about the type of cells in here. You have the ciliated pseudostratified cells so that if something sticks along here, it gets brought all the way back up and hopefully swallowed into your esophagus to your stomach where your stomach acids will kill it. And then the cartilage here is hyaline cartilage and they're C-shaped and they give that firm stability. Here you can slice across and look a little bit closer. There you can see all the cilia, the little hair-like structures <clears throat> that wave back and forth. So if you get a little piece of bacteria here, they keep waving. They'll carry the bacteria up into your throat so you can swallow it or cough it out. And then you can, <clears throat> excuse me. Wow. You can see all these pseudostratified ciliated columnar cells. Remember, all of these, they actually touch the basement membrane, which is this dark layer all the way along here. So if you have a tracheotomy or a tracheostomy, they're the same thing. What they do is they actually make a puncture in the trachea so that you bypass the nose and the mouth. So if you have an obstruction in the nose or the mouth or something's clogging it up in there, you can actually allow air to go straight down into the trachea, into the bronchi, into the lungs. So you're just trying to bypass whatever that obstruction is. And you probably have seen on most medical shows, there's always some episode where they, they do a tracheotomy and they say, oh, you know, get me a knife and a pen. And they take a pen and they take the ink cartridge out of the inside so they have a little hollow tube and then they slice them on the throat just enough. They penetrate through the trachea in between the cartilaginous rings and they stick the pen in there as an airway. That's, you know, out in the field tracheotomy type of thing. Next structures of the bronchi are the bronchioles. <clears throat> I shouldn't say or, it's bronchi, then the bronchioles. So as we're coming down in the trachea and we start branching off, these first major branches are called the bronchi. And the bronchi are splitting and they divide into each lung. So the primary bronchi goes to one lung or the other lung. Once it gets into the lung, then you have secondary bronchi. And the secondary bronchi supply each lobe. And if you look, what side is this lung? Right or left? It's the left. Remember, when you look at the left side, it's going to have this big dip for what organ to lean into it the heart. So they call this the cardiac notch, and I'll show you that again in another slide. But over here on the left side, you have less lung space on the left side, so you have two lobes. Here's a lobe, here's a lobe. On the right side, you have three lobes, here, here, and here. What's interesting is if you look at the branches, if you were to swallow something like a pea, so you're eating dinner and you swallow a pea, if it did make it down on the trachea and it rolled, it's more likely to go over into the right lower lobe because of the angle. So as this is coming down, there's less of a bend coming into the right side. Because the heart pushes this bronchi up and over, it's more rare to actually get food particles over on the left side. So just an interesting fun fact for you. And then once you get into the lobes and the tertiary bronchi actually su supply each of the individual segments inside. 
Right? And it just keeps branching and branching and branching. But those individual branches are called bronchioles. And the bronchioles are, su are surrounded by smooth muscle, which allows them to be moved. Smooth muscle, is that voluntary or involuntary? It's involuntary. So asthma actually affects the smooth muscle around the bronchioles, and it constricts it and squeezes it down, which makes it hard to move air back and forth. So if we were to take the lungs and separate all of this lung tissue off and just look at the trachea and the bronchial tree, this is what it will look like. So if you imagine this thing flipped upside down, here you have the, uh, the trunk of the tree, the major branches of the primary branches going over to the left and the right, and then you have all the secondary and tertiary branches going through. Right. So as we go into the bronchial tree, the epithelium changes again. So it was pseudostratified ciliated, now it's going to non-ciliated, simple cuboidal. So this is smooth, no cilia. Ideally, you've already caught the bacteria or the microbes and pulled them up and out. If you haven't, now, basically it's this open airway. Once the bacteria gets in here, it can start sliding down and down and down. Right. And then the incomplete rings that were the trachea are now rings of smooth muscle and connective tissue, so solid rings. It's important to remember that the sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight, your run for your life response, will adjust this smooth muscle. When you want to run for your life, do you want the smooth muscle to squeeze down and constrict your airway? No, it actually opens it up. So adrenaline or epinephrine that's involved with the sympathetic nervous system comes down here and opens up your airway. If somebody has asthma and that airway is constricting, if you give them an epinephrine-like substance, it opens their airway back up. If someone's going into like shock, anaphylactic shock and their airway is constricting and their blood vessels are opening up, you give them epinephrine, and epinephrine will, can, will reopen the airways and actually squeeze the blood vessels, bringing their blood pressure up and allowing them to breathe again. So that's why we use epinephrine. And I already mentioned this, but an asthma attack or allergic reactions constrict those airways, and the epinephrine or epinephrine-like structures will open back up. So when somebody has an inhaler, a lot of times it has um, steroids in it, but it also has a chemical that acts like epinephrine in their airway to help open their airway really quick. And that's called nebulization therapy. And then here you can see a slice of the bronchial. So here's the big airway. When you're looking along here, you have the wall. You have the smooth muscle surrounding it, and then that epithelium, remember, is simple ciliated columnar until you get down deeper and then it becomes more cuboidal. And then the next thing is that around the lungs, and we talked about this the first week of class, around the lungs you have a special watery pocket. And this pocket doesn't let water into the lungs, it's like a water balloon. So here's the lung tissue itself. Here you can see this cavity around the lungs, but it's filled with water, not air. And that cavity is really important when you get into physiology, you're going to talk a lot more about it. But it's actually this water bag that surrounds the lungs that allows the lung to expand. If you puncture that bag, then your lung will collapse. It's called a pneumothorax. Right? So the layers of this we talked about the first week. And I talked about if it touches an organ, usually the word viscera is involved. So the organ is organs, the word viscera refers to internal organs. So the visceral layer of this sac is the layer that touches the organ. Right? The parietal layer is the outer layer that touches the wall of the chest. Here you can see the rib cage coming around here, here's a vertebra back here. So here you have the wall of the chest. This part's glued on, the parietal part's glued onto the, the, the wall of the chest. The visceral layer is glued onto the lung. What's kind of cool is if you continue that idea up here, here's the visceral layer, here's the parietal layer. As you pull the lung wall out, the chest wall out, it pulls the lung with it. Because this is a water balloon. When you pull on one side, it pulls on the other. It's hard to stretch water. Water doesn't like to be stretched. So as you expand this chest wall, it pulls the whole lung out. And I'm going to talk briefly about this in just a, a couple slides, but this is more of a physiology concept and how breathing works. So I'm just going to touch on it a little bit, but I'm not going to really go into a lot of depth. But it's really cool learning about how the lungs work. Because your lungs, the muscles that expand your lungs, aren't actually touching the lung. The muscles that expand your lungs are all out here on the outside edge. They don't touch the lung. And I'll explain that again. But right now you want to remember this outer cavity is called the pleural cavity. When you have an inflammation of that cavity, it's called pleuritis or pleurisy. And it, it creates something called a friction rub, where I guess it's really painful, I've never had it, but it's hard to breathe, and every time you take a breath, it feels like somebody's pulling on your lungs on the inside, and it's very painful. 
And of course, if you puncture the sac, it's called a pneumothorax or a clasped lung because if you puncture the sac, the water balloon is broken and the whole lungs will shrink down and smash down. Right? So the lungs themselves, remember, when you refer to the lungs, you're talking about the whole organ, this big structure. So when we refer to the anatomical directions, up at the peak, just like in a mountain, is the apex. All the way down at the bottom is your base. When you look at the costal surface, costal, remember we talked about before, refers to the rib cage. So it's out here on the outside edge that's touching the ribs. So if you look out here, you have your costal surface. And then this part down here, the cardiac notch, is of course where the heart's going to slide in. And again, if you just have these lungs separated like this and you're looking at them, how do you know which one's the right and the left? Well, the left lung is going to have the cardiac notch and it's only going to have two lobes. The right one's going to have three lobes and no cardiac notch. All right, when you look at these lobes, they actually have fissures that separate them. So you have a horizontal fissure that kind of goes horizontally more than the other one does. So kind of horizontal here, and it separates the upper lobe from the medial lobe. And then you have an oblique fissure that goes more diagonal or, or oblique. And that is going to separate the medial from the inferior lo lobe. Over here, you only have two lobes. So you have just one really extreme diagonal, which is an oblique fissure, that separates the superior from the inferior lobes, or the upper lobe from the lower lobe. Right. Back here at the back, where all the blood vessels go in, and uh, this is called the hilium. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few slides. I'll show you better, closer pictures. And I already talked about this, but the fissures are what are the apparent things that help you identify the different lobes. So here's a little bit better picture, but here's the hilium or a hillus where the blood vessels are coming in, apex, the base across the bottom. Right. And then here you're looking at a posterior view. So you're looking from posterior to anterior, and you can see the cardiac notch inside there. And then I mentioned this, the blood vessels and airways enter the hillus. And the hillus is in typically any corpse organ like the kidney is going to be the same thing. You have the hilium or the hillus where all the blood vessels go into the, the kidney. It's just an area. When we talk about the spleen, I talk about having the hillus and the spleen too where the blood vessels are coming in. And here's a real lung. And you can see all these rib impressions. So this is where it connects to the rib cage or sits on the rib cage and has all those indentations. It's not disease, it's just that's the way that the lungs are. They match up with the, the rib wall. We're not going to go into all of this detail. You can see all the branches, how it branches off. And here we go. So let's go into a little bit more detail into the lobules. So as we go deeper and deeper, as you branch down further and further, and you get from the bronchioles down into the lobes, then you go into the individual packets. And these individual packets actually are full of little structures called alveoli. Right? So the bronchioles will take the air. Oops, went too far. The bronchioles will take the air down and in into these little clusters called alveolar sacs. So the alveolar sacs, they look like grape sets or, or grape bundles to me, but they're hollow cavities. So air comes down here and fills up these sacs and expands them when you expand your lung. You can see the bronchioles, the terminal or ending bronchioles when they go into these sacs, are covered in smooth muscle. So the smooth muscle allows them to be constricted or expanded, or dilated is a technical term. Right. And then the layers down here you has, just have simple squamous. You want simple squamous all the way down here at these sacs because it's one layer thick and it allows diffusion of oxygen and CO2 easily. You don't want a big fat cube cell. You don't want a columnar cell that's really tall. You want a flat, one layer thick cell down here at the very end. Right. And I'll show you. This is an actual photomicrograph of lung tissue. And you can see all these this air area in here. Here are the actual alveolar or cell walls coming along here. So you can see this kind of round grape-like structure, round grape-like structure. You can see how they have openings to each other so they can distribute the air between each other. So it doesn't just push the air into one sack and it's trapped there. The air can flush back and forth and move all over the place. Right. And then there are three types of cells you need to get familiar with the alveoli. And the alveolar are the grape-like structures. But the first one is called the type 1 cell, and that makes the wall. So it's the wall of the cell. Actually, let me just go back here. Bunk. So uh, where are we at? All along here, the type 1 cell is making the wall. 
Right? You can see one single cell thick. The type 2 cell out here, you can see how it kind of bulges out from the wall. It's not very flat. The type 2 cell actually makes a special substance called surfactant. It's this wet, lipidy-like substance that helps basically reduce surface tension. And that's more of a physiology concept of reducing surface tension. But what it means is the fancy way of saying it allows the lungs to expand easily. It doesn't make your lungs collapse so easily. It helps them expand. And a type 2 cell makes that substance. And the third type of cell is actually a macrophage. And this macrophage cruising around doing what? Macrophage, big eater. It's looking for things like bacteria or virus particles or dust particles to try and eat. I used to have a picture somewhere of a piece of asbestos and one of these alveolar uh, macrophages is trying to eat the asbestos and because the asbestos is too big it's like it would be like you trying to eat a spear so as it's trying to eat this asbestos it just punctures right through the macrophage and kills the macrophage and that's why asbestos is so dangerous because once it's in your lungs you never get rid of it your body will actually put scar tissue around it and try and protect you from it, it walls it off but you can't get rid of it once it's in there right? So again, the types of cells, type 1, simple squamous, that actually makes the wall of the alveoli. Type 2 makes that substance called surfactant. And surfactus, surfactant reduces surface tension, makes it so that your lungs can expand easier. Okay? When babies are born for two weeks before birth, their body starts prepping to make the surfactant for the first time ever. And when they're born, their, their lungs fill with surfactant so they can expand the lungs easily and breathe in air. Right? And the last one, the alveolar death cells are also the macrophages. They call them wandering macrophages because they move around all over the place. They're not fixed in one specific spot. They can move around. They can chase after bacteria, they can chase after dust, and they can eat that stuff up. Right? So the alveoli capillary membrane is super, super important because the alveoli are one simple same squamous cell thick. The capillary, also one simple squamous cell thick, we talked about when we talked about cardiovascular. The benefit of having two extremely flat, thin cells next to each other is you get really fast exchange of gases. So the gases, like oxygen, can move quickly from the alveoli into the capillary blood to be carried off the tissues. Gases like CO2 can move quickly from the capillary blood out to the alveoli so you can blow them out of your body quickly. But this whole membrane is about a half micron thick. It's super, super thin. And again, it's perfect for exchange of gas from the alveoli to the blood. And there are only four layers to cross. So when you look at it, when air is moving, it moves across alveolar epithelial wall of the type 1 cells, the wall. It moves through the basement membrane right next to it, goes through the capillary member basement membrane, and then through the capillary wall. So four layers, and that's it. But these layers are super, super thin. When you stretch out all the alveoli, if you stretch all your alveoli flat, it would actually be about the size of a handball court. So um, the lecture room that we usually are working in, if you imagine that room, if you took your lungs and steamrolled them to one layer thick, you could spread it across that entire room, your lungs. It's pretty impressive. But that big surface area allows you to get lots of diffusion of oxygen. As you age, and that surface area shrinks. If you have something like emphysema, instead of having lots of tiny alveoli, what it does is it damages or destroys the alveoli wall. It makes the alveoli huge. That so <gasps> excuse me, that may sound like a benefit, but it's actually a disadvantage because you want small alveoli and lots of them, so you have a large surface area. When you only have few alveoli but large alveoli, you have a very small surface area. It's harder for you to exchange gases, and that's what emphysema does. So if you looked at a picture of this cartoon drawing, here you can see those four layers. Air comes into the alveoli. There you have that surfactant producing cell. Here you have the macrophage. Here you have the cell wall, right, type 1. There's your nucleus. There's your long, flat, squamous cell. Air comes across that one cell through its basement membrane, through the capillary basement membrane, through the capillary wall, into a red blood cell, and carried off pretty fast. So less than a half micron, really thin. And you can see quick exchange across here. All right, the blood supply that goes to the lung, you actually have two blood supplies. It's kind of like when we talked about the heart. 
where the heart has a blood supply going into the chambers of the heart, like the atrium and the ventricle, but you also have a second blood supply of the heart that's actually fresh oxygenated blood that goes to the coronary arteries and supplies the heart itself that keeps the heart alive. The lungs are the same way. You have deoxygenated blood that arrives to the lungs to the pulmonary trunk from the right ventricle we talked about before with the pulmonary circulation. So remember the vena cava pulls the blood into the right atria, the right atria pumps it down into the right ventricle, the right ventricle pumps it out to the pulmonary trunks, to the pulmonary arteries, to the pulmonary arterioles, to the pulmonary capillaries in the lungs. Capillaries pick up fresh oxygen and then bring the oxygenated blood back. That's one passageway. But the other branch are from the bronchial arteries that come off the aorta. That has fresh oxygenated blood that goes right into the tissues of the lung, like the, the smooth muscle tissue, the connective tissue, to help provide nutrients to them. Not just oxygen, but also things like glucose and amino acids and all the lipids and raw materials it needs. So you have two blood supplies are going into the lungs. The drainage coming back, the venous drainage, just brings it all back to the heart. So all that blood gets mixed and brought back to the heart. Right? When you look at the pressure in the venous system, of course it's the vein, so it's going to have lower pressure returning. The heart actually sucks the blood back and brings it in. Right? What's kind of interesting, and this is bordering on physiology again, but I'm trying to give you the little pieces of physiology now because Next semester is coming up on us really quick, and when you go into physiology, you really have to remember these major concepts. You have to remember your anatomy so that you can understand the physiology. So what's really cool is that the pulmonary blood vessels, they actually constrict when you have low oxygen, which doesn't seem to make sense, because you'd think if you need more oxygen, then you open up the blood vessels and it carries oxygen. But remember, this is where you're picking up oxygen for the first time, so if you have barely any oxygen, you squeeze the blood vessels down and it slows the blood flow long enough that you can pick up more oxygen and drop off more CO2. You get better exchange. It's almost like if you're driving a bus um, to an area where you're trying to pick people up but you never get a chance to stop. If you want to pick a lot of people up, you slow the bus down really slow. Well, consider a red blood cell traveling through the blood as a bus. When you're moving it through the lungs and you have low oxygen on the on the red blood cell, you slow it down so plenty of oxygen can jump in. You can strict those blood vessels and it gives you more time to actually load up. When you get into physiology, we talk a lot more in detail about that. But it's just interesting how the blood supply works. It's opposite of everything else in the body. If a muscle has low oxygen, its blood vessels dilate and you carry more oxygen into it, but not the lungs. It works exactly the opposite of all the other tissues. So I've told you a million times, you want to try and remember the rules and then the exceptions. If you understand the rules to how the body works, it makes it so much simpler. And then just watch for the exceptions. Where's the body trying to catch you? What's the organ or the tissue that's trying to break the rules? And remember that. Any test you ever see, ever, 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 can only ask you two things. What's a rule and what's an exception? There's nothing else. If you learn the rules to anything, whether it's chemistry or physics or anatomy or physiology, it makes so much sense, right? And then you just watch for when the rules are broken. And they always abide some kind of logical pattern for breaking a rule, but just watch those two things, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the physiology of, of how you breathe. Um, only because it helps you to understand why the lungs are designed the way they are. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time because you're going to talk about this next semester in physiology. But the reason the air moves into the lungs is because of a change in pressure inside the air or inside the lungs. Your atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. Actually, I'll just go down. I have that on the slide. So the atmospheric pressure around you is about one atmosphere or 760 millimeters of mercury. That's just the the term you're, or the number you want to remember because that's how much pressure is there. If the air pressure in your lungs is under 760, everything likes to move from high pressure to low pressure or a high concentration of air to a low concentration of air. So if I make my lung pressure low, the air will race, in, race into it. If I make my lung pressure higher than the atmospheric air, the air moves out of it. And this is actually called Boyle's Law. And I'll show you how that works on the next slide. So if I take this chamber, and let's say this is one liter of air here with these 10 particles, we're just going to say 10 particles, and the pressure is one atmosphere. If I push down on this and I cut the volume in half, what did I do to the pressure in here? 
Well, all these particles are now cramped. They're higher pressure. Imagine the room you're sitting in. If there are 10 people in that room with you, and suddenly I take the room and I shrink its size by half, how do you feel? You feel pressure. You feel like the walls are caving in. You feel pressure. Particles feel the same way. When you, when you bring the chamber down to half its size, the pressure in there doubles. That's called Boyle's Law. So if I want to make the pressure inside my lungs high, what do I do to the size of the lungs? I shrink the lungs down. I shrink the lungs down, increasing the pressure in my lungs, forcing the air up and out into the atmosphere. So as long as I can make the pressure in my lungs over 760, it will force the air out into the low pressure 760 in the atmosphere. If I want to bring air in, all I have to do is open up the lungs or pull the lungs open. I make the volume bigger, which takes the pressure lower under 760 and the air rushes into my lungs. So it's a really cool concept and it's called Boyle's Law. Again, it's more physiology. You don't have to remember all the details of that because you're gonna spend probably a week or two in this in physiology and just understanding how this breathing mechanism works. For now, you just need to remember this is the big picture and the anatomy is the muscle, or muscles I should say, that are controlling that. So here you have the lungs underneath the rib cage. Here are all the muscles controlling breathing. So when I wanna breathe, I contract these muscles and I expand the rib cage. As I pull the rib cage up and out, it increases the volume of the lungs, decreasing the pressure in the lungs and pulling air in from the outside and down and in. So breathing actually requires muscle activity. The type of muscle is skeletal muscle. Is it voluntary or involuntary? It's voluntary. You have to have your brain involved to breathe. Your heart, remember, cardiac muscle is involuntary. so your heart can beat without your brain. You cannot breathe without your brain. If you have brain trauma and it damaged the breathing center in your brain, you die, right? Well, I guess unless they put you on a ventilator. But you have to have control of those muscles to expand them, voluntary control. So the muscles that we're gonna talk about, one of them is gonna be the diaphragm. Remember the diaphragm is that like big, um, kind of rainbow shaped muscle that goes across the bottom of the rib cage. Comes all the way across the bottom ribs over to the other side and connects to the lungs underneath. So when I contract the diaphragm, the diaphragm will move down. It's a muscle, when you contract it, it always shortens. Here's a, here's a connecting point, here's a connecting point. When I contract, it shortens the distance between the connecting point and pulls down on the lungs, expanding the volume, decreasing the pressure and bringing air in. So contracting diaphragm flattens the bottom of the lungs, basically like a, it acts like a big syringe. You pull down here and it sucks the gas into the lungs. The outer side, to expand the, the lung sideways, you have these intercostals. Inter means between, remember, costal means what? Ribs. These are the muscles between the ribs. You have two sets of intercostals. You have an exterior intercostals or an external intercostals that are on the outside part of the ribs. You have an internal that are on the inside part of the ribs. Normal breathing, for quiet breathing, you use the diaphragm and bring it down. It's a relaxed motion. Your diaphragm is very powerful. You don't have to put a lot of energy into it. And then you also use the external intercostals to bring your rib cage up and out. You're expanding your lungs down and outwards at the same time, making your lungs gigantic on the inside, lowering the pressure and sucking air in like a big syringe. Right? So the diaphragm, right, when you move it, it's going to open up the volume. So the intrathoracic or the pressure inside the thorax falls. As it falls, it pulls air in a few liters, about two to three liters will move into your lungs. So imagine a two liter bottle of, of a soda that's about how much air you breathe in a normal, relaxed breath. And then quiet expiration, all you have to do is relax those muscles. When you relax the muscles, there's no energy required here, it's passive. You relax the diaphragm, it moves back into its natural position, which means it moves up. When it moves up, it smashes the lungs. When you relax the external intercostals, they move down, smashing the lungs. You shrink the volume of the lungs which is just like pushing in on a syringe on a needle, it forces things out the other end. It's gonna push the air up and out of your, your lungs and into the you know, atmosphere. All right. 
So what's doing that is that natural relaxation. We call it elastic recoil. It's the snap back. Remember, recoil is snap back. Right? Compliance is how easily things stretch. Recoil is how easily they snap. Just like the elastic waistband on your pants. You can pull it out and it has elastic in it, so it snaps back. You know, after a couple of years of that elastic waistband, you pull it out, you can still pull it as far, you just don't get snap back. So it's just as compliant or stretchable, it just doesn't snap back. Right? So things like that elastic recoil of all the connective tissue in the muscle, around the lungs, that bring it back. And also the alveoli, they have surface tension. And that surface tension tries to collapse your lung, it pulls the lung inward, forcing air out. Right? And then the alveolar pressure increases, forcing the air up and out of the lungs. That was quiet expiration. When you labor in breathing, labor requires lots of energy, but it also requires more muscles. So, so far for a quiet, relaxed breathing, we've only talked about two sets of muscles, the external intercostals and the diaphragm. For inspiration, those two things use energy. For expiration, they don't. They just shut off. Right? For forced or labored breathing, for forced expiration, imagine, blow it as hard as you can. What muscles are you using? Do it. Nobody's watching you, just do it. Where do you feel the muscles contracting when you blow out forcefully? It's not just around your ribs anymore, it's down in your abdomen. So you're feeling your abdominal muscles contracting. So force expiration, your abdominal muscles are squeezing really hard. They're forcing your guts up into your thoracic cavity. They're pushing the diaphragm up. So as you contract this, it pushes upwards forcefully, forcing air out. Think about it, when you cough for a whole week, when you have a cold, how do your abs feel at the end of the week? They feel ripped, right? So you've been contracting them, forcing them all week long. I swear, the next time I start exercising is going to be after I get sick because when you're sick, you have no choice but to work your abs, right? So at the end of that ab workout, if you just start going to the gym afterwards, you you're already have a head start, right? So force expiration, you're moving these abdominal muscles, but you're also moving the internal intercostals. The internal intercostals pull the ribs down and in. So the abdomen smashing your guts, pushing them up into the lungs, and then the internal intercostals are compressing your rib cage in. So they're trying to smash the rib cage. Everything's trying to compress the lungs and forcefully push air up and out. That's forced expiration for like coughing or blowing out candles. Forced inspiration is when you're having a problem expanding your, your lungs. So forced inspiration, you see people that are trying to catch their breath. They're going, <gasps> Do that. There's nobody watching you again. Just do that. <gasps> forcefully breathe air in. Forcefully. What muscles are you feeling contracting? Well, you start feeling your neck muscles really contract, right? <gasps> you can feel all those muscles in your neck. The sternocleidomaster, remember, that connects from the mastoid down to the sternum and the clavicle. And then the scalenes that connect to the first ribs and pull the first ribs up. They're trying to expand the upper part of your ribs so you can bring extra air into the upper part of the lungs. Right? When you get the wind knocked out of you, what you did is you actually stun the diaphragm and you can't expand it, but you can expand these muscles. So you're trying to make up for what the diaphragm can't do by expanding these extra muscles. And that's forced inspiration. So the SEM, the scalenes, and the pec minor help lift the chest up and out. So if you look at the pressures, when the pressures change, the intrathoracic pressures are always going to stay below atmosphere. And this is talking about inside this pleural cavity. It always stays lower. The pleural cavity doesn't change that much. You can change inside the lungs, but this intrapleural cavity shouldn't change. It always stays below the other pressures. So there's always a suction in that water wall there, which is really important because that way what it does is anytime you move the rib cage on the outside, it pulls the lungs with it. So that suction, because it's always lower than the other pressure, it helps hold the parietal and the visceral layers together. It glues the water balloon together. So just a quick summary of breathing. When I want to breathe during normal, quiet inspiration, <gasps> I expand my diaphragm by pulling it down. So I'm pulling the diaphragm down. I'm expanding my external intercostals and expanding the whole lung, dropping the pressure and bringing air in. When I want to breathe out, all I do is relax those muscles. The diaphragm moves up, compressing the lungs. The rib cage moves down and in, compressing the lungs, and air is forced out. And you just go through the routine over and over and over again. Right? 
Airway resistance is determined primarily by how large the opening is in the airway. So things like the muscle that goes around it or the size of the tubes that are going into your lungs. Right? So the airway size. Here are a couple ways to do it. You can increase the size of the chest. When you increase the size of the chest, it increases the diameter of the airways. It opens them up, allowing air to move quickly. Lots of flow of air. You can also contract smooth muscles. When you contract smooth muscles, it squeezes the airway. What's that going to do to the flow? Imagine it. If you squeeze the pipe, it's going to slow down the flow. In asthma, the smooth muscle contracts without your control, without your will, and it makes it hard to move air back and forth. It's asthma. Right? Um, bronchitis can actually affect this too. Bronchitis builds up lots of mucus on the inside of the tube. It's almost like having a pipe in your kitchen that has a lot of gunk built up. The flow slows down, which means that you're not going to empty your sink as quickly. Well, when you have bronchitis, the, the flow of air slows down, which means you're not going to be able to get good air in and bad air out as easily. That's bronchitis. All right. Next, let's talk about breathing patterns. So the breathing patterns, there are some terms, and the first one's called ipnea. And ipnea is normal breathing. When you see the EU, it refers to normal at the beginning of any of the words in, in medical science. So nea, the P is silent, ipnea is silent there. That is referring to breathing. So if you stop breathing, it's A at the beginning, or apnea, like this. You stop breathing. When you're having difficulty breathing or struggle breathing, difficulty, I always remember dysfunctional as D-Y-S is at the beginning of the word. So you have a dyspnea. There you go, dyspnea, difficult way of breathing. When you breathe quickly, when you have a fast heart rate, what do they call it? They call it tachycardia. Well, we're not talking about the heart, so drop the cardia out and put nia in it, right? So it's tachypnea, rapid breathing. Right? So the words of the terms here is just some things you want to get familiar with. And then diaphragmatic breathing is when the diaphragm, <coughs> excuse me, when the diaphragm comes down and it causes the stomach to bulge out during inspiration. That's the breathing you want. They call it belly breathing too. As the diaphragm goes down, your belly comes up. Breathe in, breathe out. Costal breathing is not so good because that's when you're chest breathing. And that's when you're full of anxiety. Just imagine when you're breathing and moving your chest. It's when you have like a panic attack. But if you look at a baby, a baby does a lot of diaphragmatic breathing. They have a lot of belly breathing. Their whole belly comes out and they expand their lungs really well. That's the kind of breathing that helps relax you and calm you. So if you're feeling anxious, concentrate on... Pretend like there's nobody watching your belly come out. We're not looking at how how much you know Thanksgiving or holiday fat you've added to your, your tummy line. Just take a deep breath. If you take a deep breath and just your chest moves, that's costal breathing. You don't want that. You want all the way down at the bottom of the diaphragm to move out. And that's called diaphragmatic breathing. Right? Here are a couple terms. So I mentioned the term ventilation earlier. Ventilate just means to move air in and out of the lungs. You can ventilate a dead person. Respiration is the exchange of gases between the lungs and the blood, so if, or actually the tissue in the blood is a better term. External respiration is talking about moving it from the lungs into the capillaries of the lungs. So here it's talking about diffusing gas from areas high partial pressure. Partial pressure is represented by this letter P. So here's partial pressure of CO2. Here's partial pressure of oxygen. Okay. Partial pressure just means of all of the air pressures around, whether it's nitrogen pressure or carbon dioxide pressure or oxygen pressure, those partial pressures all add up to the total atmospheric pressure. But the partial pressure of just one is represented by this P. So the partial pressure of CO2, you see here is 45. Up here, it's 40. And when it's out in the atmosphere, it's only 0.3. There's barely any CO2 out in the air that you're breathing in. You're making the CO2 in your, in your body, moving it through your blood, pushing it into your lungs, and then your lungs are pushing out in the atmosphere. Right? That's a, a thing about gases. They always move from the highest partial pressure to the lowest. So you can see this gas is moving, the CO2 is moving from the dirty blood to the lungs, where it's only 40, and then from the lungs to the out, out in the atmosphere, where it's only 0.3. And it's going to move quickly this way. When you look at oxygen, it moves exactly the same way. The atmospheric pressure, partial pressure of oxygen is 159. It's going to come into the lungs where it's only 105, and then the lungs are going to pull it into the blood where it's only, a, well, 
here it was only 40. 159, 105, 40. And then when it comes and equilibrates so that the lung and the blood are the same at 105, then it carries off that 105 off to all the tissues. When it gets down to the tissues, you have something called internal respiration. I guess I should go through here. Uh, I'll just jump ahead. So internal respiration is when you're exchanged between the blood and the other tissues. So here, you're taking that oxygen and you're pushing the oxygen into the cells. And then the cells burn the oxygen, make carbon dioxide, accumulate carbon dioxide, push it back into the blood, you carry the carbon dioxide back up to the lungs, dump it in the lungs, and it leaves. So external respiration is bringing it from the external environment down into the lungs and into the capillaries. Internal is exchange of gas between the blood and the tissues. So a little bit different. And then gas exchange, you can see once you bring it in from the lungs, uh, down here, sorry, the lungs, it goes across the capillary wall and into the red blood cell. When you carry oxygen and CO2, oxygen is bound to a structure called hemoglobin that we talked about. We actually talked about this before in cardiovascular, but it binds to hemoglobin, oxygen does. Carbon dioxide binds more to the globin part, or carbon dioxide is turned into something called car uh, bicarbonate and it's carried through your blood. When you exchange these things, you go through a chemical reaction where you're constantly swapping them back and forth. If you look, these reactions are exactly the same. It's just the direction that they work is a little bit different. Here, you have lots of oxygen that goes into the blood, into the red blood cell. You have carbon dioxide that goes out of the red blood cell into the blood and into the lungs, and you blow it out. But when you're down at the tissues, it's exactly the opposite. You take this high oxygen red blood cell, move it over to the tissues, the oxygen jumps out and goes into the low oxygen tissue. The carbon dioxide that's accumulated comes out and into the red blood cell, and then it's carried up to the lungs again where it's high carbon dioxide moved into the lungs. It's constantly exchanging. This is a little bit more physiology, so when you get into physiology, you'll actually have to know and understand and learn how this whole chemical reaction works. But for this part of the class, you just have to understand that the lungs are here to bring oxygen in at high concentration to move it to the low concentration blood, once the low concentration blood equilibrates with the lungs, it moves it to the tissues, where now at the tissues, that blood is high oxygen, and it moves into the low oxygen tissue where it turns into carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide goes from high concentration tissue into the low concentration blood until it's equilibrated. And then the low con or sorry, the concentration of the blood here moves back to the lungs where now it's high CO2, it goes into the lungs and you blow it out. It's an exchange process. And the respiratory centers winding down at the very end. Remember, the muscles that are controlling breathing are skeletal muscles. You have to have the brain involved. So the respiratory centers are going to be located in what organ of the body? The brain. Yeah. So the respiratory centers are actually in the brain stem. Here you have two parts of the brain, or brain stem. You have the pons and the medulla oblongata. And we talked about in the nervous system that medulla oblongata is there for the primitive life structure functions. Breathing, regulating heart rate, choking, gagging, coughing, sneezing, all of those things, right? So the primary respiratory center for breathing is in the medulla oblongata. This is your basic breathing center. So the medulla oblongata has medullary rhythmicity, right? So this controls your basic breathing. The pons is for fine tuning, and the pons has these two special areas called the pneumotaxic and a, or sorry, apneustic center. These two fine tune your breathing so you don't have to listen to you going <gasps> constantly. If the medulla is the only thing controlling breathing, you'll actually breathe like this <laughs> and you stop breathing. And then you go <laughs> and you stop breathing. Because it's just trying to get gas exchange with CO2 until your CO2 levels are normal and then it stops breathing. That's all the medulla does. It just wants you to breathe and exchange oxygen carbon dioxide. It's these pons or pneumotaxic and apneustic areas that predict your breathing. They know how much oxygen, how much CO2 you're exchanging, and they regulate your breath so you have a calm, relaxed breath and you're not panting all the time. Right? So kind of the key here is that the uh, medulla oblongata is the primary spot for respiration, where the pons is for fine-tuning respirations. And of course, this is a nervous pathway, so it's a reflex, which means you always have to start with receptors out there somewhere. And the receptors, you have to know, 
are in, well, the major areas are in the carotid sinuses up here, carotid blood vessels, and the aortic arch down here. These areas have little tiny receptors that detect oxygen and, and carbon dioxide and acid concentrations. So they know when you need to breathe heavier or breathe less. If you start um, accumulating CO2 or accumulating acid here, then you're going to start breathing heavier. It sends a signal up to medulla oblongata and says, man, you've got to get rid of some of this CO2. So it's blowing out CO2. Right? Another thing that happens is when you have low oxygen here. By the way, oxygen has the smallest um, effect on your breathing. Carbon dioxide and acid actually have the highest effect on your breathing. When you accumulate CO2 and you accumulate acid, you breathe heavier. When you have low oxygen, at the point where you pass out, that's when the oxygen actually starts, starts affecting your breathing. So it's really crazy, and again, it's a cool concept you'll learn more about in physiology, but what's actually controlling your breathing is CO2. You could be in a room with very little oxygen, and you don't panic, you don't freak out, you're just thinking, man, I'm kind of sleepy. And you get tired, and you lay down, you go to sleep, and then you wake up dead, right? You don't wake up because your brain, at the time when it realizes you're low in oxygen, it's already shutting down. But if I put you in a room with high CO2 and normal oxygen, it's because of the CO2 levels. You get panicky. You're like, oh, my God, I feel like I just can't, I can't breathe. Because the CO2 levels are triggering these receptors that send a signal to the brain and say there's too much CO2. You need to breathe heavier to get rid of it. But if the room is full of CO2, you can't get rid of it very efficiently. So you start panicking. So what makes you actually get that panicky feeling when you blow up a lot of balloons, like you're blowing up lots of balloons, is because your CO2 levels are changing. Think about it. When you blow up a balloon, you're breathing in lots of oxygen. Your oxygen levels go really high, but your CO2 levels go really dangerously low. You need CO2 in your body. CO2 actually helps control acids in your body. So if you lose too much CO2, you lose too much acid in your body, and you actually become very alkaline. Again, this is more of a physiology concept, but it's, it's a really cool thing. Um, and when I teach physiology, it's usually the first day I always ask people, I, I say, so when, when you were blowing up balloons last, and you felt really lightheaded and tingling, the kind of that anxiety feeling you get when you blow up balloons, why is that? And it's funny because a lot of people are like, oh, it's because you're low in oxygen. Well, that's what they teach you in high school, but they're wrong. It's because you're actually low in carbon dioxide. You're blowing so much CO2 out, you're bringing lots of oxygen in, but you're blowing so much CO2 out that your brain's becoming too alkaline, and it causes your neurons to start misfiring rapidly, and it gives you that anxious feeling. So it's kind of a fun thing that you'll learn about later. All right, so those two areas in the ponds for fine-tuning the pneumotaxic and the, or the apneustic centers. The pneumotaxic area has inhibitory impulses. So when you start breathing too much, it actually shuts off your breathing. So <gasps> you're not constantly going <gasps> like this all the time. As you breathe in, it'll say, that's enough, and it stops it. And that also helps you so you don't blow your lungs apart by bringing too much air in. So when you're exercising, you want to bring more oxygen and more air in, but these pneumotaxic areas prevent you from blowing up your lungs. They, they put the brakes on. And if the pneumotaxic area is not doing its job, the apneustic area is like a backup, right? So it helps you control, but this one will help you um, actually have a little longer inspiration, but not strong, just a little, little longer. So these two areas help fine-tune, prevent you from over-breathing, and, and help you have a nice, long, controlled inspiration. And then regulation of the respiratory center, I've already mentioned this. Cortical influences, which means the top of the brain. You can consciously control your breathing. Think about when you're singing and you have that, that nice vibrato in your voice that I'm not even going to do it. I almost did it, but I'm not going to sound like an ass. But when you have that kind of like mellow um, shake in your voice that you want that sounds really you know, pretty, that's a cortical influence. That's you controlling your vocal or sound of your airway going back and forth. So you can voluntarily control it through cortical influences. Um, some of the limitations is that if you build up CO2, then your medulla oblongata says, forget you, brain. We're going to stay alive. It's like those kids that try and hold their breath for too long. So they get all upset and they hold their breath. <gasps> They're voluntarily doing that with the cortical influences. But when they start passing out, then suddenly the medulla oblongata kicks back and says, forget this. We're breathing. We have too much CO2. We need to, to control it or, or regulate it. So 
Um, I kind of said that already, but when you hold your breath until you faint, breathing resumes. I want to see this. I've never seen a kid do it. I want to see them hold their breath so they're blue in the face, right? And then they pass out. I just think it's, it's funny when kids do stuff like that. And then chemical regulation, this is because of primarily CO2 and hydrogen ions, which is acid. And I already kind of beat that to death, but it's primarily the changes in acid and CO2. If you have central chemoreceptors, these are actually in the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata will detect high acid and make you breathe heavier. When you breathe heavier, you blow out CO2, you blow out acids, and it helps lower the acids in your blood. Right? If you have high CO2, they call that hypercapnia. It's high CO2. You have low CO2, it's hypocapnia. Okay? What do they call it if you have low oxygen? They call it hypoxia. This has nothing to do with the oxygen. You can have normal oxygen levels, but your CO2 is high. You'll start breathing heavier. You know, your oxygen level is fine, but what you're trying to do is get rid of the CO2. The peripheral chemoreceptors are out there in the two places I told you before, the aortic, aortic um, uh, arch, the aortic body, and the carotid bodies, or the carotid sinuses. And these out here in the periphery are sensitive to acid, oxygen, and CO2. Right. So your brain itself is not detecting, detecting oxygen. Your brain, the medulla oblongata, is, can, is detecting acids and CO2. It's out by your heart and the blood coming out of your heart that's detecting oxygen. It's just wondering, is the heart pumping enough oxygen out? So it's kind of interesting. You're measuring how much blood is being pumped to the, the heart, basically, more than how much oxygen you pick up in the lungs. Right? So the aortic body... When you're talking about this, it's actually in the wall of the aorta. I already kind of already talked about it and pointed it out for you. And it sends a signal up to the medulla oblongata and the same with the carotid. So the walls of the carotid arteries, and they'll send a signal up to the medulla oblongata too. They're just different pathways going up there. And that's it. So go ahead and take that little quiz on respiratory. You probably already printed it out and have answered most of the questions already, but go ahead and take that now, and we'll see you in the next video.